there, there, I, I didn't think this conference was as large as it is, and uh, so I didn't bring enough copies. I brought 50 copies. I figured that'd be enough. No, it's not. But uh, a lot of people have copies. Perhaps you can share them sometime. And uh, it's available. The, the text is available on my very good website, not designed by me, um, called Deirdre McCluskey. Dot org. It's an interest. It's paid for by my former university, and when we when we set it up, I said I want it to be DeirdreMcCluskey.com, and they said no, 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 no. We can't do commerce. <laughs> <laughs> Here I am, a a liberal, in the sense that all you you understand, and yet uh, I've been employed by state universities since 1980. My. My, my theme today is the rise and fall of, indeed, a liberal sensitivity about the economy. And my, my colleague, my beloved colleague, Joe Persky, um, just wrote a superb book about John Stuart Mill, which you must all buy, um, in which Joe pointed out that Mill is the fulcrum, that he's the most thorough and characteristic liberal, and the beginning of, of, of well, he and, and Harriet are the beginning of socialism, the beginning of the slouch in the late 19th century towards what was called the new, the new, new liberalism of Green and Hobhouse and all that gang, and, and the Fabians, Sidney and Beatrice Webb. And then on our side of the Atlantic, the, the change from a classical liberal perspective on the economy to, say, circa 1900, the progressivism. And then the New Deal and the welfare state and so forth. Bear in mind that the welfare state was invented in Prussia, it's worth bearing, keep, keeping that fact in mind. So uh, that's, my, that's the framework of my story. Um, the rise of an understanding of what economies are like and what they do. And then what I would claim is a decline in understanding, or, uh, from my perspective, of course, my, a decline from the Chicago School, Austrian, humanomics person a decline in the understanding after 1848, and then, then uh, um, that, that decline. So the first claim from, for an audience at HES is that from Aristotle on, we, people interested in the economy, are gradually coming to understand it. And you have uh, uh, the school of Salamanca, I was honored some years ago to speak in Doug Norris' place. He couldn't make it. Uh, my friend Doug couldn't make it to Salamanca, so I, in the very hall where the School of Salamanca lectured on laissez-faire economics in the, in the 16th century, I gave a speech on, well, laissez-faire economics. Um, Sa Salamanca, the mercantilists, uh, the uh, the, uh, the then political arithmetic, and you, you know this stuff much better than I do. So there's this acceleration in economic understanding in the late 18th century, especially in the early 19th. And then I pick this emblematic date of 1848, such an important date in European history, as the peak. Um, people like 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 Bastia are 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 and are, are characteristic of this era in political economy as they still call it. And then what happened is a steady reign, R A I N, but also R how's it spelled R E I G N, something like that of imperfections in the market. So my claim is that by 1848, 
these political economists, and Mill being the chief example, understood what was going on pretty much. They, they, they still had the labor theory of value, that's too bad. They, they didn't have marginalism, well, okay. But as, uh, as, as Steve was pointing out just now, and this is a seminar, Steve Cates, they, they had the, the basic framework of understanding and, now here, this admiring a free market economy. Then what happened is one after another economist made his reputation, mainly he, by pointing to another imperfection in, in, in this free market economy. And by now, the, the way you get a Nobel Prize um, is to think up still another imperfection in the economy, uh, express it elegantly, verbally or mathematically, it doesn't much matter, and then await a call <laughs> quite early <laughs> in the morning in October. Um, <clears throat> now, I'm not making a case against mathematics or uh, hyperplanes. Some of my best friends are hyperplanes. <laughs> But I am making a case that mostly what those imperfections amounted to were qualitative, humanistic categorization claims. They weren't empirical. That's my main ob uh, objection. They weren't empirical especially I mean, even in the, in the industry that's supposed to have this imperfection, they weren't empirical, even in that industry, how big are the externalities? How big are the informational asymmetries and how important in the automobile, second-hand automobile market? How big is monopoly? One of the chief obsessions of the 1890s in the history of thought. How big are the effects of inheritance on inequality? How big, how big, how big? Even in the sector they're talking about, were usual, that, that question, that scientific and policy question of how big things are, was ignored for the most part. But especially what was ignored is the overall effect on the economy. How big, how, how significant not in the statistical sense, but in the, in the common sense sense, is monopoly in the American economy or the, or, or the British or French economy. How, how, how much does it reduce income from some imagined ideal? Or more to the point, some practically achievable ideal? We were just talking about externalities and, uh, and, and commodification in the seminar this morning. And, and, and the problem with saying that uh, all these externalities are terrible, let's bring in the government, as my friend Joe, Joe Stiglitz says, more or less just that way, um, is that it doesn't calculate how big the imperfections are in the government itself. If the government was composed of geniuses like Joe, the second Nobel Prize winner to graduate from Gary High School, by the way, first being Paul Samuelson, um, Gary, Indiana, I mean. Uh, the, so there's no, there's no quantitative sense in what Joe says. So that's the problem, and it keeps happening. And again, it doesn't matter whether it's mathematical or verbal. Uh, the Austrians have the same problem with their verbal talk. They say, socialism is impossible. I can prove it on a blackboard, or by talking enough, and you'll, you'll believe me. Well, you know, there are some worlds in which socialism would work very well. My opinion, and I share it with my Austrian colleagues, is that it isn't our world, but that's an empirical question. That's not a theoretical question. It's not something that can be... Um, that can be determined by just r ratiocination. You can't just think it through. 
This is a point that Kant made. Uh, concepts without facts, roughly, are, meaning, are not meaningless. They're not, they're not a complete science. You need the, this isn't a, a lecture against theory. I'm not against theory, as I said, I'm not against math. I'm just saying that if we're going to propose a theory as an imperfection in, the, in laissez-faire, and, or, or in favor of laissez-faire, I don't care, either one, you've got to have the facts. You can't just make a diagram on the blackboard. And say, ah, you see, the social cost of pollution is not equal to the private cost. Therefore, we should, you know, look. Externalities, let's talk about that for a moment. If I were, instead of this very handsome outfit that I got from a friend, um, I, if I wore a burnt orange dress, the older, older women here will remember burnt orange very well from the 1970s. Horrible color. I just, I mean, I think probably in God's eyes, I'm an Episcopalian or an Anglican, and I, I believe that God, she's a wor working class single mother from Leeds, by the way. <laughs> she's, she's uh, in the Caribbean origin, she's black, she's overweight. You should get ready for it. Uh, <laughs> you're going to have a hell of a shock. But anyway, she regards burnt orange as orange as an abomination. So if I was to wear it, that would be a externality. You'd all think, ah. But does that imply that we should have an office of dress colors? Where in Washington they would disorder in, in in Ottawa they they decide no dear dear you can't wear that it's forbidden so that that's the basic problem that's the basic uh, purpose of the paper is to complain about this to whine about it to whinge about it now we need theory we need categories. We need an idea like externality, although I think it's been misapplied, sure, but that's okay, but we need it. And we need to get externalities clear in our minds. But that's not a complete policy science, or I would say even a complete science uh, a to core. Here's, here's a point. The humanities are necessary for science. The humanities, philosophy, parts of history, um, English, French, the study of, of novels and poet, poems, um, uh, th theology, are the places in our culture where we think about categories. And we decide well, we, we can go to decide whether these categories exist or not, but anyway, we decide on them. We'll have a category called God, and we'll talk about the features that this category might have. We're not making an empirical statement, we're just categorizing. And that's true of the hardest sciences. Niels Bohr, the great Danish physicist, said, physics is not about the world. And you say, whoa, whoa, wait a second, a physicist is saying it's not about the world. He said, physics is what we as humans can say about the world. And it's our human categories that start science. So it's perfectly reasonable that uh, we do a, a, a qualitative study of the category labor <coughs> and capital, for example, in our own field. Or the, or the category employed, unemployed, or the, or, or threes, uh, labor capital land, uh, entrepreneurs versus managers. These are qualitative thoughts, and they're the same kinds of thoughts, they're the same exercise that pure mathematicians make. We, we in economics, at least the younger people here, have been trained in, uh, in math department math. 
You've been trained in real analysis if you got into a major graduate program in economics in the last 20 years. <coughs> real analysis is about, it's, it's uh, calculus on steroids is what it is. <laughs> and it's, it's about the existence of things. There, for every, uh, uh, how's it go? For every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta, or is it delta, there exists an epsilon, doesn't matter. Uh, um, calculus was not proven originally. For two centuries after the invention of, uh, uh, of calculus, it was used for, for practical purposes like shooting um, shells and so forth. And, not so practical purposes like understanding the heavens, without a proof that it was rigorous, that there did exist a infinitesimal quantity that wasn't zero. This whole idea of limits and then more profound arguments in what came to be known real, uh, real analysis is qualitative is humanistic. Mathematics of that character is humanistic. The proof part. Contrary to popular assumptions, um, when people don't know anything about math, they say, oh yeah, the mathematicians must know all about, about quantities. No, they don't. They don't care about it. A long time ago, I was talking to a colleague in math at the University of Iowa. I asked him what he was doing. I, I didn't expect actually to get an answer because at the frontiers of mathematics, no non-mathematician can understand what you're saying. But anyway, I asked him, How, how's your work going? And he said, oh, it's terrible. I'm calculating. <laughs> and he hated the very idea. Even you know some of the great mathematicians like, like Euler were, were great uh, calculators, but still he hated it. What mathematicians want like the Department of Theology or the Department of Philosophy, they want existence. Do things exist or not? Are they in this category or that category, the category of existence or non-existence? Unicorns are in the non-existent category. God may or may not be. That, that's the kind of thinking they're interested in doing. It's on, off, qualitative, humanistic. The uses of mathematics in engineering and physics and geology and so forth are, of course, nothing like that. I just read a, another excellent book by one of my heroes, Feynman, Richard Feynman, the great um, Caltech physicist, Nobel Prize winner, called the, the character of uh, the character of physical laws or did he call them natural? I guess he called them physical laws. And it's a wonderful book. He wrote it a couple of years before he died. And it, um, he, all through the book, he's saying, we physicists care about magnitude, how big. We don't care about existence theorems or proofs. If Fourier analysis works, we could care less whether it's proved or not. If calculus allows us to build bridges that don't fall down, fine, leave it alone. Don't, don't inquire into whether it's rigorous or not by, by this very particular mathematics department intellectual value. Now my, my so, so I'm not against mathematics, I'm not against the humanities, I'm not against economic theory, but I am saying that to have a, a complete science, you've got to go beyond this essential first humanistic step. You've got to go further. You've got to get not just serious about philosophy, I'm all for it, I've written on philosophy, but philosophy is philosophy, science is science. At least, you know, I have some problems with the word science because I know, as I hope some of you do, but the word science in English is very peculiar. It, because of a debate about chairs and chemistry at Oxford and Cambridge in the middle of the 19th century as against chairs and theology, um, the word science came to be specialized in English 
to mean physical and biological sciences. That's why people can sneer at social science. Who are you? You're not scientists, by which they mean you're not geologists. Um, whereas in every other language I've been looked into, and I, I'd like to be contradicted if it's, if it's false, the word science means what it meant in English before the middle of the 19th century. In the Oxford English Dictionary, the first citation of this new meaning of science, which became dominant, is 1863. Before that, science, uh, Alfred Marshall, by the way, used science in the old sense all, all through his career. Um, science means systematic inquiry. So there, there's nothing weird about Geisteswissenschaft of Deutsch. You know, it says spirit science. Scary music. Wee, wee. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very weird indeed. And, um, the klassische Wissenschaft in, in German means uh, classics, what we call classics. And the same is true in French and Italian. Scienza, a, a mother with, with a girl, age 12, who's doing very well in school. Someone will say, how's she doing in school? And she says, she's, she's mi, mi, mia scienzata. My scientist in English makes no sense. So I'm making a claim here about a policy science like economics. We could go on making up theories endlessly and be like having chess problems. We just keep making them up and have no regard to whether they had anything to do with the world. But if we're going to do policy, we'd better know the numbers. We'd better know if, if Supply and demand, for example, is approximately true. If it's way off, then I can't use supply and demand analysis. Uh, if uh, uh, classical theories of uh, banking or, or the investment or the unemployment are just completely wrong, then I can't use them for policy or to even for, even for economic history. I can't use them to understand what happened in the economy. So that's the issue. We've got to get beyond the humanities. Not insulting the humanities. I've, mathematics, philosophy, theology. I've uh, lit crit. I've written in three of those. I'll leave it as an exercise. To the, to the auditor to tell which ones. Uh, so I, I respect them. I think philosophers are wonderful. I, some, you know, they're great. Um, and uh, theologians, that's wonderful. Mathematicians, great. But they're not doing a quantitative policy science such as our field is. Now, let me give you a list. You can see it if you have a copy of the paper on page, uh, where is it? It's well into the, into the thing. Here we go. Page, uh, no wait a second, it's earlier than that. Page, yeah. And I have to put in my glasses to find out the page. This is so irritating about old age. Where are my glasses? I don't have my glasses. Can someone tell me what page it's on? I can't see it. 10? It starts on 10. In fact, I'd better get my glasses because I propose to read some of this. You'll notice that I didn't have a PowerPoint. That's because PowerPoint is evil. <laughs> and people don't know how to use it correctly. The worst and the best PowerPoint presentations I heard were at a conference of biologists. We ought to learn about the best. But anyway, here we are. These are the imperfections in the market, starting with Malthus to start before 1848, but then it, it accelerates this finding of imperfections without, without measurement. I'm making the same criticism, I've made it before in various forms, but I'm making the same criticism that, that another economic historian, Sir John, he wasn't Sir then, John Clapham of Cambridge, student of Marshall, 
made in the 1920s about what he called empty economic boxes. And he was particularly criticizing Pigou. He's saying the economics of welfare in almost a thousand pages, you can't find a way of deciding what increasing returns industries are. Though the main, one of the main points of the book is that the government should step in and subsidize increasing returns industries. And, and, and Clabin said, look, come on guys, we got, to, we got to have some way of knowing, or at least an example. He said, there's not even one example <laughs> of an increasing returns industry, although Clabin said, many sentences start with under conditions of increasing returns, comma, blah, 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 blah. And that's, that's, that's nice, that's humanities, but it's not the kind of science that I want and, and you want. So number one, Malthus worried that workers would proliferate. Rather crude and simple version of Malthus. Ricardo worried that landlords would in, engorge the national product. Uh, Mill worried, or perhaps was pleased by the prospect of the stationary state, worried about. Uh, but then after that, after 1848, in frantic increasing numbers, and I wish when you read the list, if you think of others, send me an email, Deirdre2 at UIC dot, dot um, edu, uh, began a list of imperfections of reasons that we shouldn't trust the results of a laissez-faire <coughs> polity. Greed, offensive to Christians. Alienation, well, that's a little earlier, the young Marx. The uneducated consumption tastes of the workers. They're so vulgar, you know. Um, the drinking habits of the workers, which was a particular focus of many economists in the late 19th century and early, early 20th. Infant industries, again, it starts rather earlier. I don't think it was called that then, but, but, but Liszt in, in Germany and Kerry, we heard that Liszt got his ideas from the, the United States in the 1820s, which I didn't know. Um, the unique national histories of economies, namely the German historical school. English economics couldn't possibly apply to Germany because Germany has its own economic history separate. Uh, the lack of bargaining strength of the workers. This became a big issue in the late 19th century, the struggle between capital and labor. Uh, racial impurity. It's worth my progressive friends, and I'm sure there's some here, need to realize that American progressives, as, 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 as David can tell you in detail, were racists. In fact, David has noticed that lots of people in the 19th century were ra racist against the um, analytic egalitarianism that he and, and Sandra have, have emphasized, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it goes on and on. Unbalanced growth, lack of planning, um, externalities, the business cycle, unemployment, tendency to unemployment. Um, investment spillovers. There was a big spurt of this just after the war, Second War. Uh, predatory pricing leading to monopoly. So why should we care about these markets? Cost push inflation. My teacher, uh, uh, um, Otto Eckstein, was an exponent of that in the 1950s. Uh, monopolistic competition. Another of my teachers, Edward Chamberlain, was on about that. Um, cultural irrationality, oligopoly. And that's just the first page and a half. It goes on and on and on and on. Get the paper on my website, read it, tell me what's wrong with these, and I'll be, if, you're, if you're right, I'll gladly admit it. Maybe these have been studied carefully empirically. I don't think so. Not in the sense I announced earlier. 
informational asymmetry. My friend George Akerlof, who had such a hard time uh, publishing the publishing the, the Lemons paper. Uh, public underinvestment, Galbraith. Not, not, not Jamie, who's empirical, but his dad, who wasn't. Um, and it just goes on and on. It's simply astonishing. When you start thinking about the arc of the history of economic thought as up to this kind of belief, whether justified or not, I'm open to scientific inquiry and whether it is of, you know, roughly laissez-faire with some uh, safety net, let's help the poor and okay, but then and it gets worse and worse and worse. Uh, lack of international com co competitiveness, Michael Porter. It's a, it's a meaningless idea, but he loves it. Um, co consumption externalities. Bob uh, Frank is a big one on this. My orange, my burnt orange case is to the point. And on it goes. I mean, for now we've got, we're into page four, in the, or three, really, if you count the halves. Underpayment of ca care workers. Nancy Fulbright has made a good case for that. I, I, I'm a feminist economist. I, I agree with Nancy. But it's an empirical question how big it is, how much it matters. It's coming to matter more, as I know from <laughs> taking care of my 94-year-old mom. Um, too big to fail, hyperbolic discounting, blah, blah, blah. Overpayment of CIC CEOs. Rising inequality soon. It's not widely understood that Thomas Piketty didn't really say that inequality everywhere, certainly not as in his own France, is increasing. He said it will pretty soon, on the basis of a combination, as he says in the first opening pages of his book, a combination of Ricardo and Marx. Uh, you do some accounting, uh, the, the rich are going to engorge the national product. Now, where have you heard that? And uh, uh, if you don't think there's a problem here, you think, oh, well, this is good. This is economics. That's how we teach it. We teach. Supply and demand for a week, and then we spend the rest of the course telling how stupid it is, um, uh, how wrong, and oh, there are all kinds of imperfections. Here they are. If you, th if you don't think it's a problem, read the bottom of page six and the top of page seven of Capital in the 21st Century, the English translation of it. And if you've got an economist's soul, <laughs> You'll be shocked by this because Piketty says he's, he's, he's worried about ownership of inelastically supplied things, oil, for example. And he says, now, of course, the, we, we cl classical or neoclassical economists think we have an answer and supply and demand. And then he completely screws up the analysis of supply and demand. I, I won't go into the details. You can, you can read them here. It's just shocking. It's the complaint about supply demands that a bright undergraduate in week three of Ec 1 would make. Um, by the end of the course, if they're still saying that, they're not so bright. <laughs> um, but so it goes. Now, now, as a final example, and I should stop because I want to hear your views on all this. Because this is a quite serious criticism of economics I'm making. Now, I, people think my rhetoric of economics talk is a criticism of economics. No, it wasn't. It was just saying theorists, um, e economists are poets but don't know it. And economists are novelists but don't know it. They depend on metaphors and, and stories. Not, a, you know, not entirely, but models or metaphors um, and, and stories of expertise. I wrote a book on that are very uh, prominent in economic thinking. So, you know, there. But I wasn't criticizing economics. I wasn't saying that's stupid. Boy, these dumb economists, they, they're poets. Poets are stupid and so the economists are stupid. This is not a good argument. And it's not what I said. 
I have criticized economists for their obsession with tests of statistical significance, which, by the way, the American Statistical Association last spring abandoned. Go look it up. The American Statistical Association, official committee of the American Statistical Association issued a paper saying that tests of statistical significance, as usually done, are nonsense, as done routinely in economics. So it won't do to go back to uh, a challenge, uh, Kopmans, in 1957 and say, well, there are theorists who develop theorems, and then he, they hand them over to econometricians for test. The theorems proliferate without bound. It's almost a mathematical proposition. Uh, Tirol, the Frenchman who got the Nobel Prize a couple of times ago. I lo looked, is it that his name? T Tirol, right? I got it right. He, he, um, he has a book on the theory of finance. And I, I didn't really read it, but I looked at it for some time. I was astonished because it was something like 300 theories of finance. I'm not making this up. Go look at the book. Just one theory after another. Well, maybe it goes this way. Maybe it goes that 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 way. And one has to ask if it's not really tested, not by this phony statistical significance stuff, but if it's not really confronted with the world, what are we talking about here? What are we doing? Are we doing chess problems? That's not even chess. The situations in chess problems, most of them couldn't arise in a real game. <laughs> uh, I won't go into it. But so as an example, let me make sure I'm doing this right. Yeah, I do Piketty and show that he's in trouble. Well, he's educated in economics in France, and that's a disadvantage. <laughs> but the, but, but a, a lot of the, this, I have 105 of these so-called imperfections, 105. Now, you'll be able to help me and give me more examples. Or you'll be able to tell me, no, no, 103 is not right. There is an empirical study of it, and it tells how important it is in the economy. I don't think so, but you can you actually, by the standards of most of the scholars and scientists on this list who invented these ideas, who came up with these ideas, Thomas Piketty is way above the average in scientific uh, verisimilitude. He's serious about the facts, and I, I go with that. Yes, go Tom. Um, but a lot of them involve monopoly. A lot of them involve the old claim, which you can find in, in, in medieval economic thought, and right back to Aristotle, that large parts of the economy are monopolized, and therefore we don't have to pay attention to supply and demand. And I think that's a non sequitur, but let's, let's speak kindly to them. And then the question is, has monopoly increased? It's a very common assumption among economists nowadays and many others who uh, are thinking about the economy, my friends in the English department who have stopped thinking about Shakespeare and are thinking about economics all the time, and I keep telling them, now dears, maybe you'd want to learn some economics before talking about it, but <laughs> they say, oh, you're a, you're a neoconservative, go away. Um, so anyway, uh, the, I, 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 I speculate, I don't do the empirical work myself, but as an economic historian, I speculate on how you might go about finding if monopoly has increased. And if you think of monopoly this way, uh, sort of, um, uh, well, I, I won't go into the t details, but if you think about monopoly as, or, or monopsony, as how many suppliers or demanders the average person faces, right? If you face um, Sears Canada, <laughs> you'd better hurry up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and some other stores, then your, uh, 
you, 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 if Sears Canada raises its prices above what you think you should pay, you can, you know, you're welcome to go to the other store. Whereas if you're stuck in a, um, a village with no transportation, the only outlet, is, the only place to buy stuff, say, is the company store, the only employer is the local lord of the manor, you're out of luck. You're, in both cases, both supply and demand, you're in a monopolized situation. And I, I think these happen in the world. It's not unusual. Um, before easy divorce, many women were stuck in marriage. And that's an artificially created monopoly situation. Monopsony or monopoly, it depends on what product you're talking about. But anyway, um, that's the point. And here's, let me do one more list and then we can, we can talk about it, talk about all this argument. The, I think it's obvious, and I'd like to know why it isn't, if you think it is, if you think I'm wrong, that monopoly facing you all has radically declined since 1800, or since 1980, or since 2000. It's radically declined because you have more and more access to alternative suppliers or of, your, of your consumption or alternative uh, demanders of your employment. Uh, uh, unless the monopolies have been enforced by, by the government. So here's the historical list, more or less in order, that broke down local monopolies. This is page, and uh, now I can re read it, page, what is it? Still can't read it, page 22. Proliferating turnpikes. It's not widely known that roads, turnpikes, were supplied by profit-making firms in large numbers in, um, in the 18th century in Britain, the United States, Sweden, lots of other places. The rise of, of private roads, I said that. Um, metalled roads, a la McAdam. Uh, um, stagecoaches on these roads. River and port improvements, which are massive in the 18th and 19th century. The canal transportation. Once in Holland, um, it was slow, but it was reliable and scheduled. The canals were how you got from one town to another, one city to another. Uh, the breakdown of guilds, that is the breakdown of official monopolies enforced by the local government. The, the breakdown of local tariffs. Most spectacular example is the Rhine, which when Germany or, or Prussia was conquered by Napoleon, the, um, the, the tariffs enforced from those castles, the robber barons, that's where the phrase comes from, on the Rhine, those castles, those wonderful castles you see on the, from the boat, those were taxing authorities. And of course, they would tax and tax and tax so that by the time you got to, to uh, 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 Amsterdam or something, you were out of luck, you had paid all your profit to the robber barons. Um, and N Napoleon had a stroke Il eliminated this. Uh, paving of roads in towns. Gas elimination of towns, early 19th century. The, the policing of roads, you know, the, the ending of, of, of piracy on the sea and uh, highwaymen on the roads. The telegraph, a big one. Steamboats on the, in, in the west of the United States. And above all, of course, the railway. And the, and the steamship, and passenger liners. Now here we're now the supply of, of, of labor. Um, the streetcar, at first pulled by horses, then by, uh, by, by cable car. At one point, Chicago had the largest cable car ne ne network in the world. The electric trolleys, finally. The department store, the department store, 
bon marché. Um, the, the bicycle. The bicycle is very important. It starts as a, uh, as a plaything of the rich, the man, of course, because you could, you know, uh, it's, it was a sport and became cheap enough for, for, for working people to buy it. And then allowed you to go to the other store if the local one was overcharging. The improvement of the, uh, of the postal service, which actually starts much earlier, but is perfected in the 19th century. Then the great mail order firms, Montgomery Ward and Sears in the United States, which are being reinvented by Amazon now, uh, 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 subways, the telephone, the automobile, the motor truck, good roads, smooth roads with tar surfaces or, or cement, especially in the 1920s. Um, the interstate highway system, the supermarket for, for groceries, instead of going around to every shop in the village, the, the, uh, the commercial strip outside of American towns, illegal in most countries, against the law in Britain and, and Germany and, and Holland, uh, the shopping mall, falling external tariffs. Once people had in the United States and Canada three and a half automobile companies to buy from, right? Ford, General Motors, Chrysler, and American Motors. Now they have 20 suppliers, South Koreans, Japanese, Germans, even Italians, if you're venturesome. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, um, the deregulation of Aaron Truck, the discount store, the internet, which is just beginning to have its effect on these matters, and, and cell phones. So my claim is that this, these, many of these claims, which depend on this false claim, empirically false claim of rising monopoly are wrong. Now, if, if this is, is, is typical of the list of imperfections, then that list of imperfections is in trouble. And our way of looking at the economy as a failure is in deep trouble. And I think it's true. I think it's true that it's characteristic. Take, a, take informational asymmetries. Think of the effect of the cell phone and the internet and the cloud on informational asymmetries in consumption or for that matter in employment. It's gigantic. So, and then the final paradox here I'll end <laughs> is that while all these imperfections from 1848 are piling up in the minds of, of economists, you know, just 105, maybe 150, I don't know. It's, I don't know when it's going to stop. Income per head in roughly liberal societies like Britain or the Canada, the United States. France is a little bit questionable. <laughs> Henry Kissinger once joked that France is the only successful communist country. <laughs> But let's, sorry, I'm sorry to make jokes about France. I love France. I mean, I, uh, no one else can make bread the way the French can. Um, uh, okay, but the, the, uh, the, the problem is that income per head, while all these imperfections, the economists are noticing, ah, oh, there's another one. Look, oh, come on, God, this, oh, the supply and demand works terribly. Look, there's another one, there's another one, up to 105. Income per head is increasing 3,000%. That's a, there's not, not, no, no speculation about it. That's a conservative estimate. We economic historians, if you don't believe it, I'm sure most of you do, come on, I'll show you. I have in my, 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 my books, my, my trilogy, 
which, by the way, you should buy. It's available cheap on Amazon. Uh, um, the, 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 uh, the, this fantastically wounded system, for the first time in human history, has made ordinary people, poor people, vastly better off. Poor people in Canada are better off than uh, probably the tenth per top percentile, bottom of the tenth, uh, Jane Austen say, in 1800 in England. Um, if you include quality improvements, which have been gigantic, I could go through them. In, in medicine, for example, I've got two artificial hips, hip joints. You know, 30 years ago, that was experimental. And I, if, if your great or great grandparent, to be secure about it, got arthritis of the hips, she ended up in a chair and she died. Now, no longer. So, so quality improvement makes it even higher because quality is very hard to uh, adjust for in the, in the deflation that you make. I'm talking about real income. So there's something dramatically wrong here. It'd be as though we had a theory of gravity and we said, well, 32 feet acceleration, 32 feet per second squared at sea level. Hey, that's cool. But wait a second. There's this terrible imperfection of air resistance. So we need to completely modify. <laughs> Acceleration of 32 feet per second. That's just wrong. That's just capitalist propaganda. <laughs> That's crap. We've got to have regulation of falling objects. They're because of the terrible imperfection of air resistance. Now look, if you're dropping it through molasses, then I'm very willing to talk about molasses resistance. But for many purposes, though not for long shots by snipers, air resistance doesn't matter. So, like everyone here, I love economics. I love its promise of helping the poor. That's why I got into economics, that's why most of you did. I wanted to, but this anti-market drizzle of imperfections without showing they matter is slowly driving me nuts. <laughs> Thank you very much.